Morning, Danny. Morning. Uh, hold on. Let me see. It's going, going. All right, we're good. We're live. Facebook. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. So today is uh, I mean, really cool topic. I'm actually super, super interested in this too because I haven't heard uh, from people that are doing what you guys are doing. Uh, today's topic is how to flip a hundred over hundred homes without leaving the office. So why don't uh, start off, Brian? What is it that you guys you know? Where are you guys from? Where are you guys do? Where are you guys at? So I'm at a JKB Capital here in Newport Beach, California. Uh, we flip homes and we also uh, own our own brokerage, which uh, we used to sell the properties. And we were doing a lot of that last year in 2018. And that's when I brought on Austin because I got overwhelmed. And we are also now converting all the leads that we've been generating from flipping homes, uh, from our sign calls, uh, our marketing, and now converting that into traditional sales as well. And um, that's what Austin's really been taking care of. Um, I'm really the fund manager and that's why the, I'm pretty much at the office the whole time. And that's why we said, you know, flip a hundred homes from the office. Cause we've got uh, agents like Austin and other people that are actually out there showing the property and getting it sold. And so, it's been um, outside more in the past week than, than over the past year. Yeah, actually it's funny. The quarantine's actually let me out um, into the field a little bit more these days. So uh, when I have to drive around and look at 25 properties in a single day, it helps when there's no traffic on the 405. Yeah, so I, uh, Brian's one that, that gets to stay in the office. I moved up to Marina Del Rey in October after being with the company for, I think we we're just at 10 months at that point by the time I moved up here. And I mean, 95% of our, our properties are, are here. We are at that point, we're flipping in San Diego, Orange County, LA and Ventura. And now our, our main, main focus is pretty much just LA and Orange County. We'll do maybe two or three deals in Ventura a quarter, uh, but with our, our focus in LA, that's where we're at now. I'm sure everyone wants to know, like, how are you guys still finding deals, like so many deals when, you know, most investors are out there trying to find two or three to do it every year? So the, there are a couple of ways that we're sourcing deals. Our, our number one way of sourcing is agent referrals. So we have in-house what we call acquisition associates that are, some of them are also realtors. Brian and I do the same thing. Like, uh, who was it yesterday? We were talking with Sean that was on one of your other webinars and he has friends down here that have property or that are constantly finding deals out door knocking so even networking with people up in in NorCal they have connections down here those agents finding deals off market are getting us the most volume as far as finding properties right now it's really easy to find deals really really easy because so many people stopped purchasing during the coronavirus so I mean, we're getting hundreds of emails a week from whether it be agents or wholesalers, bird dogs, just people out finding deals and, and they're dying for somebody to buy them. Yeah, I typically would get three to four a day just texting me and now I'm getting closer to 20 a day. So agents are hungry, people are out there looking and there's a lot of opportunity to be had right now. Mm -hmm. um, besides the agent referrals, we get a lot of uh, properties just from the MLS. You know, we're probably writing close to 40, 50 offers a day directly from the MLS, um, locking them up and then going out and walking them. And if uh, everything meets our criteria and we hit our numbers, then we'll go ahead and pull the trigger. Uh, so I would say that's probably our number two source is basically what everybody else has access to. It's just getting to it first. And, and really, a lot of the properties that we end up getting because there are so many wholesalers out trying to purchase and if somebody doesn't know what a wholesaler is, they're putting properties under contract with no intention of actually closing escrow on that property and assigning or selling the rights to that contract to another investor and taking a, a delta there for a fee. So they'll get it under contract for 600, sell it to us for say 650, and they'll make that $50,000 fee at closing. A lot of those people are getting it under contract but don't have enough buyers to actually take those contracts on. So we're getting it on the second and third time it falls out on the original price that we offer being the first people to the deal, just maintaining the relationship with the listing agent and following up. 
super important to follow up after submitting offers, even if you have to automate it through like follow up boss or some sort of CRM. Very you, I mean, it sounds like there's just a lot of inbound marketing and leads coming in with the 20 inquiries you're getting. Are you, are you putting them somewhere to, into a database? Meaning the inbound leads from our listings? Uh, these inbound people calling you with deals, like how, how are you tracking? Oh, I mean, it's kind of yeah. like selling clients, right? But how are you, what are you guys doing to keep that organized so you can back with prospect when it slows down? If it slows so down. Those people reaching out with deals for the most part are wholesalers, right? So those people are regularly emailing us when they have deals normally in a normal market without coronavirus happening when there are thousands of people out purchasing properties and flipping. We have a lot of people that watch like flip or flop. I don't know what it, it's probably the same thing in your guys market, but they think that they can go out and buy properties and flip them and, and they do maybe one or two a year and don't really make any money on them. So they're buying at 80% where we're buying at 72% of the after repair value. That's the TV show with uh, Tarek on it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, which is now at EXP as well. He joined, uh, he joined, he joined a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, he, it, one of his reps just texted me a couple of days ago trying to recruit me. I was, I was like, yeah, no thanks, man. Uh, Good, this has been going on for seven minutes and 50 seconds. I'm surprised you haven't tried to recruit us yet. <laughs> I'm a soft recruiter. <laughs> it's sure it's coming. Recruiting. I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. But to... As far as keeping those people organized, we don't have to reach out to them. They are emailing hundreds and hundreds of investors, their properties. They just have more now than they ever had because like I can go on the MLS and find deals right now that have been on the market for four or five days. And if you did that a month and a half ago, no chance. They're gone within 48 hours, obviously, depending that you can actually purchase it sight unseen. Because most right. agents now are forcing you to see them in person. Yeah, and the most important thing with the stuff on the MLS, like Austin said, is the follow-up, right? So if we'll submit an offer with it within six hours of it hitting the market, and we'll be maybe 10th in line, right? And so they're going to get another 10, 15 offers behind that. And a lot of times we're not going to win, right? Because there's somebody that's going to overpay, or they think that there's a higher exit value, or maybe it's an end user who's just going to put $30,000 into it and live in it themselves. Right. So a lot of the times a wholesaler will go in and lock it up and look for other agents or investors who buy it off of them, take their wholesale fee, but can't because they locked it up too high. But if you're that person that's constantly following up with that agent after the fact, so maybe you didn't get it, you say, all right, well, I'm going to check in with you every couple of days just to make sure, you know, usually we'll check in day three. Hey, did you get the EMD? No. Okay. Well, are you submitting the uh, notice of buyer to perform? Um, and then kind of just a quick little text the next day. Did you get it? Um, are, is it still moving forward? How's it going? Um, typically when we do that and that buyer does not perform, they come back to us first because we did follow up. We weren't like mean about it. We weren't overbearing. We we're just kind of proving along the entire timeline that we were still interested in the property and that we were the real deal. And uh, typically the agents won't go back to market. They'll just come to us direct and say, Hey, you know, you've been following up with us direct nonstop. Are you still interested? Yep. Great. They cancel. And then we just submit our EMB the next day. And a lot of times those agents in that, during that transaction, because if, if somebody has an off market deal, that's not really in, in a condition that an end user buyer could purchase it, they're usually out, prospecting, whether that be cold calling, door knocking, driving for dollars, they have other deals that they're looking at. And then it becomes a thing of, hey, you can represent us or, or help us purchase these other properties before they come to market. That way we don't have to compete. So that's where we really kind of spike the volume is being able to get to it before it goes on the market. Does anybody have any questions yet? Nothing in Q&A. If anyone has specific questions, instead of throwing it in chat, throw it in Q&A. One thing I wanted to, and we did this last time, actually, when you, you popped me in on the one with uh, that Sean was on. Yeah. I think it's super important to show, because a, a lot of agents, I was just talking to Brian this morning, if I wish somebody four or five years ago before I really knew how to look at deals, how to find deals uh, for investors. I was having investors reach out to me based on the team that I was on in Newport, but I really didn't know how to find 
the properties, analyze them, and then find the end buyer for it if it wasn't that specific investor. So that's one of the things I definitely like to touch on, whether it's now or, or in a little bit, but uh, just kind of showing whether it be new agents or longtime agents, how to find a buyer for a specific property in any neighborhood. You could even do it virtually. Uh, if you were doing wholesaling, you could do it in any state. You guys have any like slides or screenshots or something you can show us how to analyze the deal? I know, I know Sean showed this very interesting thing last time with double twos or double dots. I didn't know that was, that was a thing on the MLS where you could, you could specifically have MLS listings highlighted in certain colors if they were spotted. Yeah, so that's, that's a pretty standard thing that a lot of people will do. Let's see here. Let me pull it up. Brian, you want to answer some of the Q&A there and then I'll, I'll pull that up? Yeah, so uh, first question is, what's the average profit on wholesale, uh, wholesale or flip per project? Um, we, we're a little bit different, right? So I would, we raise the source of capital and then we use that and then leverage it uh, with hard money loans. And a lot of people are just trying to make, you know, maybe $100,000 per deal where uh, on the flip side where they hold on to it. But that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort where we're a volume play, where we want to um, just turn over that money every, you know, let's call it 150, 180 days. That way we can turn it two, two and a half, three times a year. Um, so, well, some flippers aim to make 18, 20% per deal. We we're looking at like six and a half percent. Um, that way, we take it, we model that three times. We can do a lot of volume rather than just the one big hits because the big hits are great, but they don't, they're few and far between, right? If you're in this for a volume play. So we're at about six and a half, seven, eight percent, um, which is, comes up to about $30,000 a deal. It's a lot of work for a $30,000 deal. But again, if you're doing 119 of them a year, like we did, um, you know, it adds up pretty quick. Yeah, and there are commissions involved, fees, all kinds of stuff with that. So it's not just, that's, that's the actual profit on the deal. And then, yeah, over 119 deals, some of them are, are going to be losers. It's inevitable. We don't get to see every little detail of the property before closing on it. Uh, but the other ones make up for that. Yeah. All right. Now, as far as the wholesales go, we're probably looking, you know, we, we've done... We don't do a lot of wholesaling because we like to actually move forward with our projects. But if we can get out of one without any risk, you know, we've done them for 10,000 and we've done them for 150,000. So th there's a huge our range. Best, in that. Our best one last, uh, last year was 159,000 on one wholesale. All right. Let me, you want me to show you what, uh, kind of go over what Sean was going over and how that can be used and then layer on top of that, Kenny. Yeah, any, any cool tips or like cool. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay, so we are in the CRMLS here. Let me close this. Can you guys see this all right? Kenny, yeah. is this showing? All right, so if you go back through here, this is when you're looking at how to find a, a buyer for a property. So say we're looking for somebody, we're looking for a group of investors that we can hopefully reach out to after we've gone out and door knocked a, a home that looks like it needs work. And this is something that, that I do regularly as far as we'll get somebody that will call us and say, hey, I saw you guys purchase this property. Looks like you're renovating it. Would you be interested in buying my house as well? If we go walk the property and it's not something that we would purchase, I'm not just going to pass on it. I want to find a buyer for that property and try and sell it for them off market. Uh, a good example of this was a property that's, that's not far from me. I walked through the property. It was in a little better condition than we would normally purchase. Guy wanted a little bit more than we would pay. So I jumped in here and I just kind of choose all of these showing who is purchasing in the specific zip code that we're in. So we're in 90043, Windsor Hills. I'd go back, uh, we could actually do 365. Now, I, I think if, 
if I'm not mistaken, up where you guys are at, Kenny, you guys don't have to where you can see who's on title, specifically just on the MLS, right? No, we have to take two extra steps. Okay. All right. That's not too bad then. So when we're looking in here, I was looking at a property on Dean. So that was going to be over this way. And when you're looking at, at, say I was looking at a property on this street here and it's off market, I see that it's going to be specifically an investor deal. Doing this search, I can see that this was purchased, renovated and resold. So I paid 640 and they closed at 790. This is an investor deal. You can, I mean, even without opening it, you can see that it was renovated. This is going to be the current owner's name. So you'll have to go back in title to see who the owner was originally. But the goal is to hopefully find this property while it's still active or pending. So you can see who the LLC or corporation is that owns it. And then you, you want to reverse, pro or, uh, not reverse prospect, but uh, skip trace it. We have been using, uh, what is that called? Lead Sherpa, which has been awesome. It's mostly mobile phone. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of tough if you're trying to get hold, get a hold of homeowners that are maybe older when they're trying to just find deals off market. But for investors specifically, if we're usually out driving around, we don't normally have a, an office. Like Brian doesn't leave the office. I never, I don't even go to an office. So getting that mobile number is super important. You can skip trace LLCs and corporations through Lead Sherpa. So during this process, you just look at whatever all of the number twos are. That shows that they purchased, resold. You're going to call through that. Literally six months ago, found a property on Dean Avenue, which is just down from here. And while I was at the house, did this in front of the homeowner, showed them all of the properties that were investor properties, skip traced all of them that afternoon, had the buyers in the next morning, and we ended up in escrow over what the seller wanted uh, within 24 hours. So this is definitely something that's actionable you can do today. If you have uh, a property that maybe the seller is not willing to show as far as it being the, the whole COVID situation, but it's got to be distressed because it has to be an investor deal. Okay. So when you guys, you guys find the deal, then you find a buyer, you put them together, you get the buyer's commission. Do you typically all... You get buyer and seller commission on that. Oh, buyer, of course. So you, you yeah, so you're double ending that deal. And, and mind you, that's based on you negotiating it, right? Because yeah. for that seller specifically, uh, it, it was it was a trust sale. The the mother died, they had the house, they'd owned the house and the family for like 85 yeah, years. If it's on the MLS, isn't there a listing agent that signed to it already? So the property that I'm talking about, so say we're on Dean right here. This is actually yeah. where I was at. I called around on, on a specific deal that I did. I brought the agent in that represented the buyer uh, or sorry, represented the investor on the other transaction because I could not find the LLC owner's name. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get this thing into escrow within the next 48 hours or so. Cause the family was super stressed about paying that next payment. For me, it wasn't a big deal. If you asked me that two years ago and I didn't have volume, I would have gone and found an investor that wasn't represented by an, an agent and, and built a relationship with them after showing them the property and you can represent both sides, but you've got to negotiate that commission up front with the seller. So, so on those type of deals, you're, you guys are just doing a, a single side transaction and that's it, right? Cause after the buyer investor buys it with the other agent, you guys, that's, that's the end of that. On that one. Yes. Okay. Correct. Well, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's my, that's my most recent experience with this as far as doing an uh, off market transaction that way in the past, it's yeah. you. Right. Close right. On yeah. It. So, how, so you, you guys said how many last year? 120, 150. What's yeah. The, and that's what? right. We did 119, uh, one shy of our goal of 10 a month, which uh, uh, how many that, of those, one um, that one closed on January 2nd. How many of the 119 last year? Let's just break down some of these numbers. How many of the ones last year, 119, was off market, and how many was wholesale, and how many MLS? Just like roughly. I would say it was 60 percent. Um, that was kind of agent relationship. Mm -hmm. um, probably another 25 percent that was um, on the MLS, and maybe 10 percent that were off market, and then the rest was just from wholesalers or you know, relationships, even from friends and family. Like we've 
actually flipped a deal just recently that was a friend of a friend that uh, the family was moving out of town. We bought the house, and I flipped it in 112 days. Uh-huh. And uh, that was actually our best deal to date was through a friend, funny enough. Yeah. Any, any tips for some like, um, I mean, not, not everyone here has million dollars of hedge fund money, but I need like tips on how agents can kind of get themselves out there. So maybe people will be more open to pitching them deals versus looking for them, kind of like how, how you guys have positioned yourselves. Yeah, so that's actually one of the things that I think we put in the, the description. It's, it, this is another one of those things like why, how did my mentors initially not know that I could go out and work with hedge funds or work with big investment groups and explain that? That, that should have been, more people need to know how to go out and find these people other than wholesalers because wholesalers are scrappy. They they find us no matter what we put a property or, or uh, close on a property and it could be a blind trust. A wholesaler will find a way to reach us if they have an off market deal to sell to us. So as far as people reaching out to you with deals, that just comes from honestly doing volume or being in a really hot neighborhood and flipping it one home. You should have a few people reaching out to you from that. A lot of it's Facebook groups, uh, a lot of it's wholesaling Facebook groups, but as far as not having a hedge fund that you represent now, any agent can go and represent a hedge fund. If you just look up who's the same way I was just showing the people buying properties and renovating, reselling them, and it shows as a two on your MLS in the last year, as you start digging through the areas you want to work in, you'll see over and over, like if you do this around that zip code that I was just in, you'll see JKV Capital probably close to 25 times. At that point you go, oh, okay, I need to get in touch with JKV Capital. If you find a phone number for JKV, it's gonna go to Brian. And Brian's gonna tell you exactly what our pro forma numbers look like, what we're looking for in properties in that specific area, give you his email, his phone number. And now whenever you go to a listing appointment or you find an off-market deal, you already have a built-in buyer. And as long as you're bringing volume, so a lot of times we want to be able to sell our own properties and that's for so many different reasons of controlling the asset, obviously not having to pay a ton of commissions on it because we're buying pretty tight deals. But uh, when you start bringing enough deals, three, four, five deals a quarter for us, you you get to have some favorable fees as far as uh, listing fees, being able to be the main listing agent. It's just building a relationship Cause you got to like, if you're bringing value like that, that's huge. That's essentially removing the cost of that's, that's the same amount of transactions and an acquisition associate would get on salary. So you're replacing the salary of an, an acquisition associate within one of those companies in theory by bringing that many deals to them. So anyone can represent a hedge fund as long as you know how to look at deals and it just comes from calling them and asking them the right questions. Yeah. Just for one example, a gentleman uh, down in Torrance brought us an incredible deal that, uh, that we love is actually one of the first ones that I brought Austin to. I remember it was that two story with the pool in the backyard. Um, and he wanted, he, it was off market. So we would have known about it without him. He only brought it to us because we had done a deal with him previously and we did purchase it. Uh, he did ask for the relist and I did want to give it to him. But when I ran the numbers, I was like, you know what, this makes sense. And we already did well on the last deal. So he double ended it on the front. Uh, we finished it in, I think six or seven months. He put it back on the market within a week. He had double ended the deal again. So he ended up making 10% and the acquisition was at 800,000 and we ended up selling it for 1.15. So, that agent made you never heard from him again. I think he went on vacation permanently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, just on that one deal, he made close to ninety-three grand or something, which was wild, and it upset me. But uh, but we did well on both of them. Um, and so, again, when you bring value like he did, like you're going to get value back out of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, someone had a quick question about like hard money loans or your own money. I mean, the money you guys are borrowing. Uh, what is it costing you or using? Uh, 
on the hard money stuff, uh, it's a relationship. We we only do use one lender, and they do they ask us to not talk about our rate with them, unfortunately. So, uh, but we do right. We have a fund that we manage, and of that, we pay our investors quarterly. And on top of that, we do have the hard money, which we use to leverage, so we can um, you know do volume rather than you know thirty deals a year. It gives us the ability to do that one hundred and twenty, like we discussed. But even if you're like. Like Brian said, we're not supposed to uh, to really share what our rates are and stuff like that, a relationship. But so if you are asking based on what your maybe investors could expect or what you can be talking to your investors about, somebody that has no experience is going to pay close to 10% in a normal market for their hard money, unless they're shopping around and they have business experience. Like it, it is not based on what their income is. It's not based on their job it's truly based deal by deal. So some of that's negotiable. I'd say a decent rate is like 8% paying one point to one and a half points up front. Which and may have honestly just increased increase slightly after with COVID going on. Uh, yeah, I'm saying in a normal- A lot point. of hard money lenders is, yeah, has, have disappeared. So um, if you're paying a little bit more than that right now, I would say that that's pretty standard. Yeah, yeah. We're, we've seen in the past couple of years, probably like eight to 10% and yeah. like, one or two points up front it's what the amount of money coming in the market the rates have been dropping but i'm not sure about right now like what, with all this condition yeah we're i mean at least down here it's tough to find anyone willing to lend hard money to anyone that doesn't have a ton of experience like unless you have a really solid track record they're basically telling them like hey like it's not it's not worth it for us right now come back in a month so finding a good hard money and that, that comes down again, relationships, same thing for your hard money, your agents, investors, it's all, it all comes back to relationships as far as being able to continue your business, whether it's in a pandemic like this, a downturn, that's a, a truly economic downturn. It's based on relationships. Um, so, so you, you guys have a bunch of projects going on. Like what, how are you guys managing construction? Do you have a, like a general, general contractor and, or a company I'll source too, because that I can imagine. That. Brian, Brian has intimately been a part of that for the past month, uh, and we we all were in the beginning. But Brian could probably explain it best. So we have a construction manager that kind of runs point on all the projects, make sure that we're staying on budget, which is really important, obviously. Um, that and timelines most important. So, you know, you really do have three phases in this: it's the acquisition, it's the construction, and it's the disposition. Uh, they're all very important, but to me, the acquisition's the most important, right? So you've got, yeah. you, you really have your game plan and your strategy for each asset at the acquisition, right? So if you get it at the price you want, you stay on budget with construction, you do it in a timely fashion, and then you sell it for what you think you can sell it for, you're good. But it all starts right up at the front. So in regards to the construction, it's, we're literally going property to property, touching them three times a week, no matter what. So right now we have 35 that are currently under construction, uh, 12 on the market, and I want to say five in escrow at the moment. Um, just like everybody else, we're feeling it. I, I lost like four escrows, five escrows since it started. Um, so those are back on the market, hopefully getting those back in quickly. It's just uh, constantly being on top of these guys and having somebody running point because I can't do it. Uh, Austin, you know, I'm always in the office. I'm crunching the numbers. Austin is out there trying to um, sell them before they even hit the market. Um, plus dealing with all the uh, traditional deals that we're getting out of it. Um, but I would say th the construction is the hardest part. Absolutely. Uh, because you've got a crew, a sub crew, and then you've got subs underneath that. And having contact with all of them at all times on that many projects, it's very difficult. Yeah, I can I, if I could hire three more construction managers, like the one we have, I would. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we manage like six to 10 listings at a time. And that, that in itself is like really hard with just partner agents. Uh, but it sounds like with you guys, the end, the end goal is making sure you get the amount, the return back. So there's some uh, time, time is on the construction side. because they just trust you? We want these returns, buy for this, get for this timely fashion right yeah, yeah exactly right so we don't when we put them on the market we're not you know putting them on like a your average typical seller right they're like oh my house is worth this um 
and they don't care if it sits on the market for three, four months, as long as they get it. Typically when we put our properties on the market, they're selling within a week or at least they're in escrow within a week. Cause we don't, it's not an event pricing where we're underpricing it and it's not the overpricing. It's like right where we think it's going to sell uh, in that market in that moment. And hopefully we get maybe three, four offers and we get to push the price up a little bit. Um, we've gotten up to 25 offers on, on one deal uh, before where it's, which is pretty abnormal in LA, but I know up North uh, 25 is kind of like your typical in a normal market. <laughs> So uh, this is a, uh, have you guys heard of Proppy? So I have Proppy coming on on uh, my Facebook Live later. I, I think it's today, I'm pretty sure it's today. Um, but they do offer management software, which I haven't seen before, where a link goes up and people submit the offer by typing it in. And then you can immediately have a conversation with them, like reject it or, or talk to them about the offer. Cause it's good to manage a lot. So I, we have, we just- What's it called? Proppy, P-R-O, we just signed up for it last week. It's like, I think it's like 20 bucks a month. But sounds like you have 25 offers coming in. That could save you a lot of time um, having the agents input their offers. Yeah, we have a full-time listing coordinator that uh, started as Brian's assistant initially. And I mean, granted, it's still pretty much being an assistant full-time, but she has to deal with it as far as the, the huge influx of, of offers. But we're really good about, we don't counter everybody. We mm -hmm. make sure to make it super clear to people like, look, if you want to be a part of those, those uh, responses to the offers, you need to be in the top four or five offers to get that response. Because we're finding, and especially right now, we're finding people submitting super low offers just to see what's going to land. I would imagine they're submitting the same thing on four or five similar properties. And uh, they're just not getting, getting the counter offer. But yeah, that property yeah. I think would be we awesome. Brokerment as well. I don't know if you, you've used that before, but Brokerment has a, basically once you put the property within the system it creates a link that we put in the mls and it says submit uh, offers to this link they click on it they put in a uh, few lines of information and then they upload the contract and then on the back end we can literally see all the offers that are in there it shows us the price uh, the down payment um, kind of all the the main points that you want to see when you get an offer and within the system you can literally hit decline decline you know counter accept whatever it is that you want. Um, we've been using Brokerment for, I, I want to say like nine or 10 months now. And, um, I really like it. It's a, it's a great system. And it, that also holds all of our um, transactions, right? So kind of similar to SkySlope or- uh, We use Sky, uh, Jisoo, we, whatever. Sky Slopes and lot, most of the large brokerages around here, like Fair Homes Garden, Red Oak, they, I think they all use SkySlope. Yeah. I hate the user interface on SkySlope. I literally cannot stand it. Um, cause we used to have that and we transferred over to Brokerman and it's, it's night and day that helps you manage your pipeline a lot better as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, did we answer the question? I feel like we're on a, on track to go somewhere else with that, but we do have some more questions if we want to get to those. Sure. Let's do it. I've been answering them. Um, oh, okay. As we've been chatting, uh, but it looks like we've got a couple more. How big is your organization? Uh, we have about 20 people that work full time. And then on top of our construction with our subs and everything else, it's probably closer to 50. Um, and how do you concentrate your AMs? Compensate your, your acquisition manager. So our, our AAs, uh, those guys are paid, paid a pretty basic salary and they're motivated based on bonuses and that's been through a few different iterations, but I think that's kind of where we're the most happy at the moment. Once they start producing, it seems like a natural progression for those guys to go and get their, uh, get their real estate license. They end up turning into commission only, and then they're just pulling uh, their fees out of commissions, which ends up being better for everyone. They make more money and, uh, and we're able to pull the, the fees and the commissions on that as well. Yeah, essentially, it's almost like a training program at the beginning. Exactly. Yeah, we try and, to be. Uh, a... What pivot are you guys making with the current market scaling down a bit, uh, or That's just conservative job. with the numbers? Uh, with that, I mean, we we have pulled back a little bit just to see what's happening. Um, but for us, with in regards to the numbers, we more so look at the acquisition. Again, I said that's what's the most important to us. 
So it's not the after renovation value that we're concentrating on. It's the acquisition price that we can get it for. If we can get that low enough um, to the point where we can build in, you know, an extra 10% or we can, you know, kind of see how the market's moving from there, we can put different finishes in the house. We don't have to spend, you know, on some projects we spend $210,000 just in renovations. We can cut that back, maybe 50,000, make it still look as good, but maybe it doesn't have real hardwood floors. Maybe it has engineered uh, floors or it has laminate. Um, if it's a million dollar property, we're probably gonna do better than laminate, but we can make those adjustments um, mid construction. So. Again, it's, it always reverts back to the very beginning. What can we buy it for? Um, and then is it common to have staging needs for those properties? What flipping projects do you see that have the most need for staging? Um, we typically stage all of our stuff, um, but we have built a relationship where it's very cost effective for us. Um, I would say our average house is three bed, two bath. Um, and that would typically cost maybe what, $4,500, $5,000. And, and we've got more than, I would say, 60% discount on that just by using the same people over and over. Um, so we built that in every aspect of our company, right? Whether it be uh, escrow or staging or photography, you know, we have a photographer that was kind of just doing it as a hobby and we jumped all over him and kind of just getting going. And he's been a godsend. Like we love this guy to the point where I will not even share his name with you, um, but yeah, he's we, an absolute rock star him for us. Build a website when he initially launched, and this was with all of our vendors. It's again, going right back to the whole thing of relationships. We try and take such good care of our people, like our escrow officer, her mom and dad passed away in the same month. And when she came back, it was like, dude, we get, we're going to lunch, like checking in on her while she's gone all of that stuff. And even if you're not doing a ton of volume, it's super important to keep those. And this photographer, when he launched, he was super stressed about scheduling stuff. We helped him build out his, uh, his website. And now he does all of the photos for Southern California KB Homes uh, and two other big developers. And now we can barely get them booked at this point. And he's having to hire, I think he has 15 photographers now. <laughs> so and just taking 32 care of your editors. Yeah. yeah. So, and when he started, it was just him and his wife. Yeah. And that was a year ago, maybe. So he, his company has grown significantly since. And like, we feel like we helped him do that. And, uh, but then he really took it from there. And we're, yeah. Like, even one of the first properties we sent him to, uh, we told him it was ready and it was still dirty and dusty. And, you know, the contractor said that the cleaners were there. He walked in, saw it look like shit, called a Molly maid. They came over, cleaned the property. He paid them and then uh, just charge us on the bill. And it took him an extra four hours. And like the moment that happened, I was like, this is our guy. Yeah, you know, because he went that extra mile. Yeah, hey, I want to touch on, I, I don't think we answered Miguel's question entirely. He asked hard money loans or your own money. And we're very similar to a smaller investor. We're, we're using some of our own money out of our fund. Uh, a lot of times our own money out of our, our company as far as JKV Capital and then hard money as well. It's in order to do volume and you have to leverage, uh, it's the same thing. Like Wedgwood's going to be kind of the same model uh, or a few other big, I don't know if Wedgwood does stuff up there, but they're huge down here and same exact model. Do we answer everyone's questions? I figured Sean would be. We did it. Uh, I mean, so I want to hear more about your, like your regular, you know, you do construction, you do acquisitions. What about the regular real estate side? You know, which is where most of us are. What, what do yeah, you guys so that's, that's where I'm at. That's, and that's where Brian actually jumped into the company. What did we decide? You were there a month before I ended up coming on board. And at that time, a, a friend, I was doing just regular sales, but trying to really get into the investment side. So I jumped on board with Brian as a, we called it a buyer's agent, but it was kind of a, a everything at this point and now he's president i'm vice president of the company i focus on trying to convert leads that come in from our, our listing signs we do some zillow spend in some of the areas and it's been it's been really difficult to do that over time because we're so 
I also do stuff with construction and design. I also do stuff with the acquisition team. So I don't get to do just full-time sales like I did when I was a regular agent, but that's where we started to bring on agents that we knew could convert. And now we're launching our new brokerage, which is truly just based on focusing directly on leveraging. I mean, if you had 35 listings you knew were coming to the market, or if I had that two years ago or a year ago, not with JKV, I would have been leveraging that like crazy. I would who's have been doing your open houses uh, for okay. who's doing your open houses. We were letting other outside agents do our open houses, but we were getting feedback. Literally people walking out of our, our houses with someone else holding it open. They're like, Hey, you probably shouldn't let that person do that because they're talking shit on your property while they're in there. And it's, I mean, you know, just as well as we do, because you do the sales training with your, your agents, agents are always trying to, I, I don't blame them. They're just trying to build rapport with that person. If the person is saying like, oh, that kind of looks like a, a crappy door jam or something, then that agent jumps on board with them. So they're just trying to kind of follow the conversation. And if somebody doesn't like something in the house, they kind of follow that track through the open houses. So now no one does. Well, That's one really good example of that was uh, we let a guy do one of our deals or hold an open house. And I didn't know that he had the listing three doors down. And so he held the open house and ours was talking shit on it and was bringing all the buyers to single party showings uh, to his own listing. Yeah. Um, so we learned that list. We actually, you know, start searching um, around the area to see what listings they have or what their team has just to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Mind you, we, uh, we have some relationships with, uh, with some teams and people that we've worked with in the past, uh, the Tim Gavin group here in LA, Tim is, is a longtime friend of mine and he has seven agents. I think they're allowed to hold our listings open and I've tested them. I've gone into each of their open houses while they were there, asked them questions. They don't know what I look like. So I just asked them questions and they've all been awesome. So they have full rights. They can literally text me at any time. Hey, saw you guys hit the market. Can I hold it? Yeah, go for it. Uh, if they get the, the other side of the deal, we're happy. We love having them on the other side of the deals. That's awesome. I think you guys are able to do that because it's your brokerage. You can set the requirements. I yep. know in the Bay Area, uh, Keller Williams and Compass are, I think they write them, it's in their guidelines too. They're very much against outside agents representing their properties. Over now. Yeah, I think Keller Williams here is okay with it. Uh, I, I don't know if maybe that's a new thing that they've done because I used to hold open houses for Keller Williams agents when I was brand new at a different brokerage. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of our whole thing of, of launching this new company. Like I said, we're supposed to launch on the 14th, but coronavirus is kind of the DRE won't even open mail at this point for almost five weeks and then another five weeks. So we, we've already got a couple of compass agents in the pipeline that are joining. When I'm holding open houses and focusing as much time as I can on converting leads, I'll close two to three transactions in a month. And then there'll be a period where it could be some, something shifting in our company of an employee leaving or uh, a new investment group coming on board with us. And then my, my distraction is there for a month. And then it'll close three transactions in a month again. So my, my deal flow is a little bit different, but an agent coming on board working with us should be able to close at least two deals a month just on us giving them leads. They don't have to do any prospecting, no cold calling, door knocking, none of that. They can go into open houses if they want to, but the whole benefit is we have 400 or so leads coming in a month. I cannot handle 400 leads a month. <laughs> what, what's your most of those are organic as well, Kenny. That's the crazy part, right? Because if you got 35 signs in the ground, um, you know, just people walking by, it obviously depends on the area. Uh, some some deals we get three, four calls a day alone on. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah, about 100 re paid, paid leads. Like yeah. Through Zillow or, or. Zillow, Boomtown, whatever. Um, but we have more organic leads than we can possibly handle right now. So last year was all about, you know, getting more efficient in regards to the flipping business, right? Now that we've really got that kind of nailed down. Now it's all about converting on the traditional stuff that we get from the flip business. I mean, what, uh, what are you guys using to do call captures on those type of organic uh, sales sign leads? Uh, so we have Ring Central, um, and so basically we have a bunch of different numbers, and 
once the sign call or somebody calls a sign, it goes directly to Austin, but whether he answers it, misses it, or goes to voicemail, it, um, we use Zapier to shoot that directly into Boomtown as a lead. And then it, from there, he can go in, write notes and uh, assign them, you know, based on if it's in Orange County or if it's in LA or an agent and then type some notes and send that right over to either another agent or for him to, you know, go out and convert and set an appointment or just delete them, you know, cause we, we still do get agent calls um, and other people just kind of just curious. Cool. Uh, what's the easiest way for people to get in touch with you if they're interested in uh, getting on your list or joining your brokerage or pitching you deals? Go to that guy. Instagram, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would probably be me. Me, I'd be the best point of contact, but my Instagram handles on my name there. It's austin.w.glass. My email address I can throw in the chat box. It's just austin at upstartresidential.com. And uh, yeah, I'll drop my info in the chat box. I just threw mine into the chat and uh, we actually have a good question from Miguel. It says, do you believe you can apply your system to acquire properties in all states? I'm in South Florida and we had a lot of Brazilian, uh, Venezuelan, Chinese and Russian investors that pretty much flipped everything that went sideways in 08. The only properties that are available are getting a wholesale. Um, so we are, I, I, I have a bunch of applications right here. I am currently getting my license in Idaho, uh, Florida, Texas and Georgia. And that's because we also do rentals, right? So the flip is our main business, but we're also doing a long-term uh, rental fund as well. That's and we're doing like, that in what? other states. So it's difficult to do that business or the flip business without being there, without being able to get eyes on the properties, right? We'd have to create a whole new infrastructure in each area. Um, that part is difficult and costs a lot of money where just doing the rentals, we can, um, you know, we put maybe five grand into it just to fix it up, depending, and then almost, and lease them out almost immediately. And that's just a, a long-term play. So you can definitely do it where you're at. It's just for us, that would be difficult without us actually being there or, you know, with a team that we sent out there, right? Like Austin was here in Orange County with me and he was so talented and a lot of our opportunity was in LA. So I just shipped him, him his wife and his daughter out to LA on a whim. And uh, he's been doing really well. Found out on maybe. a Friday and was moved by the following Friday. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll send you to Florida next. No, thank you. Also, any uh, last questions before we wrap this up from um, Facebook or Zoom? Yeah, you got it, Miguel. And if you guys have questions, you can message us directly. I know there are a few other ones, uh, but we want to. We're trying to keep it to like 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, message us, email us, happy to talk, happy to share whatever info we have. Awesome, okay, well, thank you guys for uh, joining us today. We'll love to have you more. We have that team rich one, I might try to get you guys on the team broker model. Um, I think that's May 11th, I'll, I'll hit you up directly. Yeah, yeah. we're actually doing thank something much, completely Kenny. different than most people are, uh, are doing today. Um, so happy to share that and also get some insight from you. Like, we obviously don't know everything and we're happy to collaborate with, uh, with other like-minded people. So and we're going to continue to bug the shit out of you on Instagram. So keep answering. <laughs> Nonstop. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Kenny. Cool. Awesome. Bye guys. Yeah.